Radio 212, complex. DPS, go. Inco, go. PUS, go. Surgeon, go. Booster, go. Copy that, we have a go from you guys. This is Talking Sound. Everybody, welcome to the Talking Sound Podcast, the only podcast where negative 10 is a number to be desired. We're coming at you straight from the throbbing heart of rock and roll known as Austin, Texas. My name is Chris Jordan, and today on the Talking Sound Podcast, we're going to talk about what it is that brought me to be an audio engineer, uh, to pursue, pursue this course in my life, and even to start this podcast. So, uh, tell you what, let's bring up that Pink Floyd again for just a second. Because I absolutely love this song. This was one of those songs that, when I first heard it, it was it was a true moment in my life. And what this song means to me is discovery. Uh, it it was a true discovery when I found it. At the time, I was probably around uh, sophomore in high school, something like that. And I'd been involved with tech theater. I'd done many things like that previously. And had always been into music, had always listened to music. Um, Even when I was growing up and was a young child, I was in choir uh, in elementary school and in junior high. Uh, Junior high is when I found musical theater. And that's when I really discovered the fact that I wanted to do something in that realm. Uh, whether it be on stage or whether it be technical. As I grew older, I realized that, well, stage is not necessarily where I belong. Uh, there There are many people that are much more apt to being on stage than me, but I did have an aptitude for lighting and for sound, uh, specifically cueing sounds, things like that, that were part of script. And... I guess it was around late junior high, early high school that I really started to discover music and really start to explore it. And I had a few friends that played music, things like that. And as I hit high school specifically, uh, I remember my my first band that I was really into was Led Zeppelin. I was I was all about it. Within a year, I, I had had all four of their first albums and a couple of their others. Uh, One of my friends had given me a live recording and I just listened to it like crazy. And I I listened to a lot of modern music. Um, And I had heard Pink Floyd before, but I had never really knew that I was listening to Pink Floyd. It was just, it was one of those things that was on the radio when I was young, uh, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And I guess it just never cued that what you are listening to is Pink Floyd. Uh, But when I saw the video for Learning to Fly, I remember I came home from school and that was was the MTV generation, you know, it was the early 90s and MTV was on, I had it on in the background while I was doing my homework, uh, probably once and forever, believe it or not, Mom, it did happen occasionally. Um, It was a rare moment, which is why I distinctly remember this, Um, but... It came on, and it was on in the background. I wasn't even really watching it. And my ears just perked up. Something inside of me made me want to stop what I was doing and listen. And from that point on, I was hooked. I'm I'm admittedly a raging Floyd head. Uh, Even my guitar tone, personally, is chasing after Gilmore uh, every time I create a pedal or anything like that. But... It, it was really a true moment of discovery for me when I found that because at that point I started critically listening to music. I started really trying to find things that were new and interesting and brought about that feeling that I had when I listened to that. And I started exploring through other friends. Uh, my brother's friends were a huge, huge influence in that. Uh, they listened to a lot of Pink Floyd, his friends Trey and Eugene. Um, 
they they really did and they brought me to a deeper understanding of more of their albums um, but once I hit college really was when I started getting into audio again um, at that point I I had started playing an instrument I started playing bass and teaching myself bass and through friends at school uh, they found out that I did stuff in theater and high school and stuff like that. And they would ask me to come, you know, run run their PA head at a show or in the in the bar downstairs on campus, something like that. And that that's when I really started finding the fact that I enjoyed that aspect of it. And it was it was right up around when I was nineteen, twenty years old that I started recording my own music and that I got a analog four track. And at that point it was it was a whole different realm it was a whole different world my my entire view on everything changed suddenly i started hearing things in the aspect of timing i started listening to all the little nuances in the background of music and though i was writing a lot of uh acoustic music a lot of guitar music what I would later come to do was much more soundtrack style avant-garde music, which was, um, you know, much more 20 minute long pieces, things like that, that were arrangement of sound and sonics instead of melody and harmony. And that from that, I uh, up around that point was when I connected with someone I'd been on the radio for about two years as a local guest artist on a show on KPFT in Houston, still one of my favorite channels there. I love that station, and uh, if anybody there is listening, please, please go support them. They are amazing. They're a great conduit of local music here in Texas, um, and a big launching platform for a lot of people, a lot of people. Um, once I was on there, I found a gentleman who will actually have on a get as a guest very soon. I talked to him today, and uh, he was all about coming on. Uh, my very good friend Alan Cunningham contacted the show and was, I guess, intrigued with how I had my process of recording because I recorded everything on analog four track. He was trying to build an analog studio and I knew people in town where he could get vintage gear equipment at really good prices. So we agreed to get together and he basically took me under his wing and saw what I could do and saw my potential and tar started teaching me live sound reinforcement, which, which is audio engineering and it's in, in a different aspect. It's, it's being able to put on live venues and outdoor shows, things like that, where you need large, large sound systems. It's not necessarily direct recording or studio recording like a lot of audio engineering is. So... Uh, it's a whole new realm of challenges and things like that. And it really intrigued me, and I got into it. You know, sure, it was hot, sweaty work in the summer in Texas, loading gear, unloading a big U-Haul full of stuff and setting it up. But at the same time, I loved it. Uh, I had always been a wires and gadget kid. I mean, even when I was a young, young child, uh, I remember fondly my my 10th birthday, my grandmother bought me a soldering iron and it kind of ticked my mom off. She thought I was going to burn the house down, and I came close a couple times, but she was fast asleep, so nobody ever knew about it. Uh, things were taken care of. But I, I was always tinkering. I was always taking things apart, figuring out how they worked. And naturally, audio engineering was that to me. It was patching one device into another to see how they reacted together. It was... Let me put a little bit of this. It, it, it was like cooking. It was, it was so organic to me, the way that things moved at a live show. And I, like I said, I'd done some work myself in my home studio. Uh, I'd been at recording sessions with friends in large studios. And as much as I enjoyed the process, it was always slightly cold to me because it was take after take after take. You know, you have the opportunity to do it over and over again. But whenever I would see these bands, especially the bands that Alan worked with, that were specifically uh, in the genre of jam band, where they would play three, four songs strung together for 30 minutes. Sometimes a set was nonstop for an hour and a half, and then they'd take a break and come back and do it again. It was, it was phenomenal to me. It was amazing. And it brought back a lot of the thrill of 
uh, being in live theater and the way that things are organic on stage. And even though, yeah, you're scripted uh, and there are cues and everything, there's still an organic quality, a, a synergy that happens between the players. And you have to be tapped into that synergy behind your control board with lighting and be ready to be there to accentuate the moment. And it, it was very much that aspect that I loved. And even now, you can probably tell in my voice, there's, there's a little thrill, there's, there's a little excitement. Um, it's because I love it. There is a thrill in it. Every time you plug in and watch all those lights come on and get to, get to hear your booming multiple hundreds of thousands of watts of power coming at you from, you know, almost a football field away. It's, it's phenomenal, phenomenal. It's an incredible thrill. And it, I've, I've continued on that path for a long time. Uh, for almost 20 years now, I've done venue shows. I've done large format outdoor shows. I've done, you know, coliseum shows. It really shocked a lot of people when I moved here to Austin uh, to get engaged that with my live sound company, um, I actually tucked that away and went into the corporate AV world like a fish to water. I loved it. Um, for me, it got rid of a lot of hassles. I wasn't necessarily having to find a lot of my own work anymore. People were coming to me, and it was, it was great. Um, it was calming. It wasn't five, six bands in a night. You know, you never know what's going to happen. You never know what dude's going to jump up on stage and try and knock gear down. Um, even, even now, uh, there, there are a couple teeth that aren't in my head because I worked rock and roll for a very long time. And whenever you're trying to wade your way to a stage through a mosh pit, sometimes you catch an elbow. So, um, on occasion, you know, you catch a large piece of soccer pecs in the face and it knocks a tooth out. So things like that don't necessarily happen in the corporate environment all the time. Uh, it's a little bit more calm. Most of your work is not nearly as grimy. You're not outside all the time. You get to, and it's a different realm of challenges. You know, there's, there's not a whole lot of, um, mistake to it. There's not really a whole lot of, you know, leeway as far as, Hey, we've got a little bit of feedback, you know, that happens at a live show. So you're used to it in a rock and roll environment, but in a corporate environment, you can have none of that. It cannot exist. It can't happen. Uh, money starts getting lost rapidly when it does. So um, for me, being an audio engineer was really following something that since I was a child, uh, I wanted to be a part of somehow. Um, I was always into music. I was always playing music or doing something musically, but it was it was very easy for me to be able to uh bring this about as a part of my life um it's very challenging it's hard uh you do have to do a lot of searching to find gigs and to keep gigs going but once once you get going with it it's absolutely addictive absolutely and the creative realms are just phenomenally huge. Uh, I was talking with someone today how much, how integral audio is to just about every experience that we have in our life. Even whenever you watch movies, even if, whenever you use apps in your phone and everything else, all of these sounds are meant to get you interacted. They're meant to be there to engage you in what's going on with your device or in the world around you. It's getting to where now audio is being incorporated into a lot of art exhibits, um, into a lot of video, sh uh, video production, even in the corporate realm. Because, like he was saying, whenever you have a brick that's being projected onto a building and it's going to fall, it looks cool, but it's not very believable if you don't hear the brick hit the ground. It's not very believable if you don't hear the wall crumble and the earth shake before the brick falls. What made the brick fall? It just confuses people. So audio is an integral part of life and the way that we view and uh, listen to things. Now, myself, as I was saying, uh, learning to fly was a big moment for me because it, it really made me sit up and listen. From that point on, I wasn't just a passive listener to music anymore. Um, 
I started listening to nuances. I started listening to influences and started researching people and finding out, you know, who my favorite bands were influenced by. And I suddenly wanted to listen to what they had listened to that made them want to write music to begin with. So it's really a snowball effect once you start getting into this kind of stuff. It's, uh, it's very addictive and audio engineering itself is not just science, it's art. It's like I was saying before, very, very akin to cooking where, whereas baking is very specified. And if you don't follow the ingredients and the temperatures and the formula properly, the souffle will not rise. The, the cake will not bake. It just won't. Um, whereas with cooking, there's some flex, some flow. You know, you can, you can add a dash of this, a, a bam, so to speak. And uh, you can do that with live audio. You know, it's, it's fun sometimes just to throw in that little bit of reverb or vocal at that key moment and hear the, you know, see the crowd's reaction and see the singer's reaction and, you know, know the fact that that, that didn't exist until just then. And you kind of made that moment happen. Um, the funny thing about most sound guys is that we are the ones that are in the back. We're in black. We don't. We don't really move from, if you see us move, it's probably because something has gone horribly, horribly awry. Um, we, we sit still for a reason, you know, because we've got our ears on and we've got a perspective on the room. Every once in a while we'll get up and we'll walk around, but uh, most of the time we are a sedentary lot. We sit and we obsess over our sound and over all the little nuances of things that are happening. And... Uh, it's that obsessive nature that brings about the organization in sound and sonics and everything that you hear as far as um, mixing on an album, mixing in a live show, things like that. Uh, and it's a very, very hard discipline to follow at the same time because where you want to be creative and you want to do these things, you have to make sure that you're being true to the material. You have to make sure that you're not distracting the listener from what's going on actively. So there's a lot of nuance, there's a lot of sway to it. And it's, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons I came up with this podcast is um, as I get older, I find that I, I kind of pass on a lot of what I know about audio engineering and working in venues, working in churches, working, at, working in the corporate realm, booking your own gigs. Uh, advertising your own company, advertising your own band, getting your own recording done. Um, it's, I just really want to give people a leg up. I wish that somebody had been able to, like Alan did, kind of take me under their wing as far as all of those things and the hard bumps in the road. Um, it really helps a lot whenever somebody takes you under their wing and kind of shows you the way and says, this is the easiest way to do it um, after years of experience. So uh, that's part of the reason that I started this podcast. Um, I've been writing articles for the last year or so for a local magazine here in town, uh, Rock and Ro Rockstar Magazine. And it's, uh, it's interesting the way that bringing all of those technical articles about has really brought me to a point where I want to share this experience with people. I want people to understand that just because you went to full sale for rock and roll doesn't mean you can't do something else. I've spent a couple of years doing broadcast audio and video. I, in my time, have done you know background soundtracks for art pieces, all kinds of things. So the realm of audio engineering, from Foley work for movies to uh, video games to app music to everything involving sound, there is so much there that... I think we really get pigeonholed a lot into this rock and roll aspect. Uh, and sure, we're going to have rock and roll engineers here because, well, it's Austin, Texas. You, you can pretty much throw a rock just about anywhere and hear it, hit a guitar player and have it bounce off onto a sound guy um, who's there trying to get a gig from the guitar player. But <laughs> we're, we're going to be talking about all of that, and that's what this show is all about. It's bare bones. It's stripped down. It's as honest and true and to the point as you can get and that that's what it's all about i'm here to try to dispel some of the myths professionally about sound guys you know we're like i said we're very ocd we're very particular we have a way that we do things and 
our stage and our booth is laid out to that. And when we let a stranger into our place, the fingers start twitching and it's like, why are you touching my EQ? Please don't touch my EQ. Excuse me. Excuse me. Don't, please don't touch my EQ, please. Please. Say man! And it's, it's hard for us not to because there are babies and we built them and we constructed these sound systems and we take care of them and we maintain them to make sure that they have optimal function all the time. And when we get someone on there who we just, it's really mainly the fact that we don't know you yet. If we knew you a little bit better, we'd trust you with it, you know? I mean, really, if you just meet someone, are you typically going to be like, hey, can you watch my kid for 15 or 20 minutes? I'm going to run down the road to grab a pack of butts, you know, and take off. You, you normally don't. So uh, that, that's where a lot of it comes from. You know, we're very particular about our sound and about the way our systems are set up and about the way our pads of audio are organized. And we don't mean to, we don't mean to jump on people. Um, so we're here to dis dispel a lot of that myth, to get rid of that, and to let people understand we're people too. And that we're doing this because we absolutely love it. We love it. We live for it. Even, it, it, even today, I was talking with my wife, and it blew her mind the fact that I'd worked all week, but I've been at home modding pedals and, for the last day, and I was coming here to record tonight. And she was like, my God, you know, what? when do you stop? And I was like, I can't, I can't stop. It is what I do. It's what I love. Like I live for it. And it's, it's an amazing ride and it's amazing adventure. And when you start engineering, when you start mixing with things, when you start learning what all the knobs and buttons and sliders and faders and VU meters and lights are for, man, it is, it is literally an experience like no other. Um, when someone, the most common question that we get asked by the people who are kindly supporting us with their beverages while we work, you know, you really know what all those buttons and knobs do? Well, actually, I know what about 15 of them do, and it's multiplied about 25 times over. But, yeah, I know what they all do. You know, it's not that complex. There's only about eight or nine controls, and it's duplicated numerous times across it. So, uh it's not a true miracle. Uh, we don't necessarily feed magic elves in the box, but uh, we take care of the magic elves in the box. We make sure that they're happy. So um, on that note, that pretty much wraps it up for today's edition of the Talking Sound Podcast. Uh, thank you so much for listening. This has been the Confessions of an Audio Engineer. Here soon we're going to be having some guests in studio, local engineers, um, other people, artists, uh, even some designers. Uh, I've got a guitar designer who's looking at coming in very soon, so we'll be talking about tone and what kind of instruments you should look for to achieve different tones. Um, please, please, don't forget, visit us online. www.talkingsoundshow.com is the website. www.talkingsoundshow.com. We just got a whole bunch of permissions from... Uh, different distributors and audio, all kinds of different people in the industry who are letting us repost their articles so that all of you can be up to date on the latest news and gear in the industry, which is so, so important, guys. And I know it's hard to keep up with it because it's all over the place, so we're trying to conglomerate it in one section. If you go up there, we've got a little news button, and on there is a section called industry news as well as talking sound news where you can find out all the latest updates things like that coming from talking sound here after we have a few episodes we'll actually have uh, an actual app for everybody so you can have talking sound right there in your pocket also please don't forget if you enjoy what you're hearing in audio format with the free downloads don't forget to visit our youtube channel our youtube channel is where we have all of the fun stuff like instructional videos and everything else where you can go and see what happens live in the studio because this is unscripted y'all we don't there there is no uh teleprompter or anything like that so things that happen they just happen and uh in addition to that we also have our social media don't forget to visit us on facebook that is facebook.com forward slash talking sound show as well as on Twitter. We are on Twitter. You can tweet us at Talking Sound. So once again, everybody, my name is Chris Jordan. Thank you so much for tuning in this week, and we will see you soon on the next edition of the Talking Sound Podcast. 
Take care and see you soon, everyone. Bye bye.